Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Donald Mastronardi, the chair of the Learning and Retirement Committee. And I'm happy to say that we have uh, a new series starting today on monuments and memory. Um, this was arranged by Tom LeCur, who will be giving the introduction in just a minute. And I'd like to remind you that the next two lectures are on Monday, April 12th, and then back to Tuesday for the third one, two weeks from today on April 20th. So now I will uh, turn it over to Tom LeCur, who actually organized this series to introduce our speaker, Stephen Small. Um, thank you. So um, Donald asked me to organize a series on something. And when he asked me, it was the height of the um, iconoclastic moment, if you will, or iconoclastic period in American history. And I thought we would get a perspective on this from other, in other national traditions. And so I asked, um, Stephen Small to uh, be the first speaker in the series. Um, he says, you know, from the from the PowerPoint now, the professor in the Department of African American Studies, he came to the subject of today's lecture, which is to say the history of slavery um, hidden, but also stunningly evident in some of the great country houses of England. Honestly, he grew up in Liverpool. You will hear some of uh, uh, a a a a. a um, I would say attenuated version of the little Republican accent so as to be intelligible to the rest of us, um, which as you know, is probably more than any other city in the Western world, um, bears, it mark, bears the marks of slavery. What Manchester was the industrial revolution, Liverpool was the slavery. That is to say, um, the port city was the hub of the world's trade in humans. And Steve is now working on a book on black culture in that city in the, in the late 20th century. It's the only city in England in which the majority of the black population is African and of local origin and of mixed, um, mixed race, unlike uh, other cities in England where they're immigrants and um, Jamaicans and so forth. So in some sense, he's working on a, the legacy of this history that, that, he, that whose memory he'll be talking about. Today's talk is in some sense a sequel, that is to say a similar story in a very different venue of his just completed book, which inside the shadows of the big house, 21st century antebellum slave cabins, which is about free plantations in Southern Louisiana. Um, and uh, that I think is, is will um, reorient, he hopes, uh, heritage tour tourism around those cabins rather than around the great houses that, that they surround. I heard him lecture on that topic and I felt just, um, a tinge of optimism that maybe these places, um, maybe these will be places to which Americans can learn a more, a new and a more capacious version of their history. Um, Stephen Small studied in England. His uh, master's of science is from Bristol, Britain's second slave, uh, slaving city. He came to Berkeley for his PhD in sociology. After that, he taught in England and at UMass Amherst before coming here in 1995. And he's taught her ever since. He's remained though part of a broad academic community, um, which I think is unusual. He was for five years, the extraordinary professor for the study of Dutch slavery and its legacy in the Department of History in Amsterdam. And he's been director of education abroad programs in Spain, in France, in Bordeaux, the center of the, of the French slave trade uh, in Brazil and in Zimbabwe. So the chapter to the talk today, I think, will be about his latest project, which is still in the early stages, tracing slavery and imperialism in England stately homes. Stephen. Okay, thank you very much, Tom. Thank you to my colleagues, our colleagues at the Retirement Center who have helped me set up the talk and arrange the technical details. Thanks very much to Tom, who's been very gracious in his introduction and who invited me to give this talk, which I appreciate. And welcome to everybody who's attending. I noticed on the Zoom, I see some of my very close, personal and professional friends, Troy Duster, Harry Legrand, Ben Tucker, and many others. It's good that you're here, although I can't see you. I was gonna say it's good to see you, but I can't see you, okay. <laughs> the people of England have more than enough on their plate right now. Brexit has had tremendous economic political and social adverse consequences with which the people of England and Great Britain and the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland are dealing with. The consequences of the public health crisis around COVID is still unfolding with very serious and unfortunate consequences. 
and the issues of slavery and imperialism and their legacies refuse to remain silent. Immediately after the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis, a series of people, individuals of all colors, classes, genders, and I assume religions began to target the physical infrastructure which embodied the legacy of slavery and imperialism. This is the statue of Edward Colston in Bristol, who was a slave trader and profited enormously from the slave trade. That statue was later thrown in a river. It was recovered from the river and is now being held, I understand, in a warehouse that was in 1920. Nathaniel Tobias Coleman had been calling for the road statue to be removed from Oriel College, Oxford, for several years. The statue has now been removed. The Oxford University had refused for quite a while, but after the killing of George Floyd, that statue has now been removed. And many of the statues around the country have been threatened. These are police officers in London protecting the statue of one of Britain's most imperial uh, politicians, most well-known imperial politicians, Winston Churchill. Okay. To add salt to the injury, to add salt to the wounds rather, a recent report in the last month published on behalf of the British government has reported that in their view, there is no evidence to sustain the belief that institutional racism exists in Britain. Okay. This report has been wild, widely criticized as incompetent, inaccurate, insufficient, and as misrepresenting the very clear evidence that's available on institutional racism in the United Kingdom. One of the recent people to criticize the report is David Olasuga, a professor of sociology, who is one of the foremost historians, television personalities in Britain on the history of Black Britain and of slavery. And he called the report historically illiterate. Okay. Racism is the real pandemic, which is exacerbating and reinforcing the adverse consequences for people of color in general and for black people in particular across Britain is the response to the report. The government is not remaining quiet. Prime Minister Boris Johnson said British people should no longer cringe about British history. Once it was reported that the BBC proms were going to drop the lyrics of Royal Britannia. Kemi Badenoch, the Equalities Minister and also Secretary at the Treasury or Under Secretary at the Treasury. She is one of about 23 black members of parliament, black and eight, no black members of parliament in the United Kingdom. And she said that the promotion of critical race theory is an ideology that sees my blackness as a black woman as victimhood and their whiteness as oppression. And I want to be absolutely clear that this government stands unequivocally against critical race theory. In the last few uh, weeks, the government uh, minister for culture has argued that British flags, which currently only fly for 20 times a year, are actually a proud reminder of our history, British history. And he's introduced the measure, which means that the Union Jack will now fly every single day of the year in as many buildings as possible. And he drew part of his inspiration, he says, from the United States. The United States flies its flag every day. Why shouldn't we? Despite or, or instead because of these debates, it's necessary to remind people that Britain was very centrally involved in what became transatlantic slavery. The Portuguese led and initiated the so-called transatlantic slave trade. The Spanish followed up, but it was the British that took over and transported more enslaved Africans, or rather more correctly, more Africans captured into vicious slavery than any other nation until the start of the 19th century. Britain was central to the conquest, colonization, and colonies in Africa and across what became the Americas. Britain was central to the political domination, economic exploitation, and social subordination of Africans and their ancestors. Britain was central to the invention, the creation, the articulation, and the dissemination of racist ideologies. 
in religion, in biology, and elsewhere. And let's not forget, European nations, including Great Britain, invented and articulated theories of racism before the United States ever came into existence. In Britain today and across Europe, there's widespread evidence from a variety of sources, from scholars, foundations, and government itself of everyday racism in immigration, housing, employment, education, policing, and health. Stereotypes, racial discrimination, and inequality are widespread, and the Brits in general express innocence, smug ignorance, and frequently resentment about being accused of racism. All of these phenomena in the past and at present from slavery to imperialism and the contemporary situation reveal gendered masculinist enterprises led by politicians, military, missionaries, and others who are mainly men. Many of these issues for Great Britain have been well documented, although that documentation, except for the example of Eric Williams, has only happened in the last three or four decades. Britain made tremendous profits, was involved in economic activity, developed uh, extensive political power. The Eric Williams thesis has yet to be uh, fundamentally revoked, although it is being roundly criticized. His thesis that the profits from slavery funded in large part the Industrial Revolution. Britain and slavery saw the growth of ports like Liverpool, London, and Bristol. And when slavery was legally abolished in the 1830s, the British government paid 20 million pounds sterling in compensation to the owners of human property. The West India Lobby is the nickname for a group of politicians, many of whom were owners of enslaved property themselves in Britain who lobbied unsuccessfully to prevent the abolition of slavery. And there's extensive evidence that businesses, banks, museums, universities, statues, and other physical structures and cultural institutions benefited directly and indirectly from slavery. Where do stately houses fit in? The study of stately houses are an end in themselves or is an end in itself by which we seek to find out the who, what, when, where, and why of the proceeds from slavery and imperialism that went towards funding the building, the accoutrements, the gardens, and the lifestyles of these houses and the people that lived in them. And the study of these houses is also a means to an end. It's another chapter in the increasing encompassing analysis to create a history that is more accurate, more comprehensive, and more inclusive in its knowledge of British slavery, colonialism, imperialism, and their legacies. How many stately homes are there in Great Britain? I'm mainly focusing on England. Uh, the documents that I read, the books that I read, convey that there were at a peak over 5,000 so-called stately homes in the mid 19th century. Many of these were lost to deterioration. Some were destroyed because of an inability financially to keep them. And today in Britain, the National Trust and others report that there are around 3,000 stately homes. Uh, the vast majority, I presume, are private, although I'm not entirely sure about that, okay? The National Trust has a, in its peer view, in its jurisdiction, over 270 properties. And in a recent report uh, in the last two years, it's revealed that about, nas about 90 National Trust properties are directly connected to British colonialism or imperialism. And that means not just in the colonization of Africa and the Americas, but also elsewhere uh, in the nations that made Britain, Great Britain. One of the major impetuses to the study of uh, state houses, stately houses, uh, but not only stately houses, but one of the main impetuses has come from the work of Catherine Hall, Nicholas Draper and colleagues at the university, at University College London, okay. They report uh, the data on every single person who received compensation under the Slavery Abolition Act in 1833, which legally manumitted around 800,000 enslaved persons. 
Nicholas Draper's book, The Price of Emancipation in 2010, is the first book to detail every single recipient, institution, or individual of those uh, compensation. And he documents over 30,000 awards for the more than 800,000 enslaved people, manumitted. He reports that more than 5,000 of these awards received eight on over 500 pounds sterling at the time, and far more awards under 500 pounds sterling. And he documents ways in which MPs, companies, churches, women across multiple cities, towns, and rural areas receive compensation. In other words, this book reminded us of and documented in an evidence-based way what many of us suspected, which is that the benefits, the profits, the fruits, if we can call them that, of slavery and the slave trade went far beyond the usual suspects of London, Bristol, and Liverpool, who were the foremost ports in slavery. But they reached out to touch almost, if I can be permitted a sit in hyperbole, almost every corner, every nook and cranny of British society. I'm not saying that he's the only person, but this was a major precipitant. And since 2007, Catherine Hall, Nicholas Draper and colleagues at UCL have produced a series of books and a very extensive website uh, documenting all the recipients of those compensation claims. So where do stately homes fit in? Let me just give you some examples. Now I'm not gonna document all the information from each of these homes, that would take too much time. Well, here's some examples of stately homes that were uh, direct beneficiaries of slavery, of slavery and to some extent colonialism. This is Harewood House in Yorkshire. Uh, Peckover House in Cambridgeshire. Oh, why am I say Cambridgeshire? I've become American. This is Cambridgeshire, okay. Tissington Hall in Derbyshire. Paxton Hall in Berwickshire. Charborough House or Charborough House in Dorset. Durham Park in Gloucestershire. And here's some images from inside this house. I got these from my colleague, Jessica Moody, who has written quite extensively on country houses and just published a book last year called The Persistence of Memory, a, a main focus on Liverpool. Okay. And then more recently, in the last few months, it's been revealed that one of the current members of parliament uh, conservative members of parliament for South Dor Dorset, Richard Drax, is the owner of Draxton Hall Plantation, forgive the spelling there, in Barbados today. Sir Hilary Beckles, who is a distinguished international historian of slavery in the Caribbean and elsewhere, and also the vice chancellor of the University of the West Indies, has said, if Richard Drax was in front of me today, I would tell him it's necessary for there to be reparatory justice, and you should return the Hall, Draxton Hall Plantation to the people of Barbados. I don't know how he's responded, but my guess would be not very positively. I could be wrong. Okay. Why are these stately homes relevant to the analysis of slavery and imperialism? Here's several reasons. Many of them were built directly with money from slavery, from slave trainers and owners of enslaved populations across the Caribbean and in what became Latin America. Many of these people inherited money in the 20 million pounds compensation, also from other inheritances and investments. This money enabled them to acquire and own land, to develop and acquire political office. For example, it was necessary for members of parliament to have a minimum amount of money at different periods in time in order to become members of parliament. And members of the Gladstone family, several of the men, were able to become uh, owners of enslaved property across the Caribbean and to use that money to uh, send their children to private schools, what we in England call public schools, and to become members of parliament. And one of the sons, William Ewart Gladstone, to become a, a four times prime minister of Britain. The stately homes also house people that formed influential social networks, achieved social mobility. And I don't mean from the working class to the middle class, I mean from the middle class into the aristocracy. 
The houses were the physical places where there was widespread consumption of colonial goods, the most notable being sugar, coffee, tea, and spices. We have evidence of enslaved people working, typically defined as servants across Britain. And let me mention that some of the evidence we have suggests that there were around 15,000 black people in Britain in the 1770s. That's one 5,000 black people in Britain. We don't know exactly how many of them were enslaved, but we have clear evidence that a significant number of them were. And at that time, 15,000 is less than one eighth of 1% of the British population. These houses also hold unknown uh, portraits, statues, ornaments that caricature Africans and black people. And many of these houses functioned as private museums and exhibit centers before they became public museums and university collections. Okay. One of the things that has caught my eye in the debates in Britain and the public discourse on legacies of slavery is that almost everyone is preoccupied with legacies of slavery. And I hear almost nothing about legacies of imperialism. Discussion of imperialism, British imperialism, seems to me to be almost entirely absent from the public debates. And although there is extensive scholarship, as my friend Tom LeCure has reminded me, on British imperialism, it's still the case that explicit discussions of imperialism seem to be absent from these public debates, these public discussions. Clearly, people like Churchill and others are mentioned, but I don't see an attempt to demarcate and identify the parameters of imperialism in comparison with the parameters of slavery. Rhodes, Cecil Rhodes clearly was an imperial figure. This, and this is a statue at Oxford, Oriel College, Oxford. The statue to the right is of William Ewart Gladstone. This is in the gardens at the back of St. George's Hall. It's an imperial statue. And he was an imperial figure, four times prime minister of Great Britain um, in the imperial period. And what we see is that while there's a focus on slavery, I'd like to see and encourage far more discussion of imperialism. And imperialism is the consolidation and expansion of the political, economic, and social domination of the British over the territories that they had conquered and colonized uh, during the slavery period. Also, some imperial buildings from Liverpool. These are the so-called Three Graces, which are at the pier head. Britain proudly represents, sorry, Liverpool proudly represents itself as the second city of empire. The Royal Liver Building, the Cunard Building, and the Port of Liverpool Building are all imperial structures, as are so many of the other notable buildings in Liverpool including St. George's Hall, in the back gardens of which is the statue of William Ewart Gladstone. Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. This was the first school of tropical medicine in the world. The London School of Tropical Medicine followed shortly after. And the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine was funded by Sir Alfred Jones with very strong encouragement from Chamberlain, who was the foreign secretary, not entirely sure, secretary for colonies, you could look that up, at the time of the 1890s. And the primary goal of the School of Tropical Medicine was to make Africa safe for white people. And, um, and this was achieved uh, over the course of time. Okay. Stately homes, statues, Museums are the monuments that celebrate the so-called achievements of British slavery and British imperialism. So where are black people's monuments? Black people do not have grand houses, massive museums, uh, expensive artifacts, uh, which they can house in massive museums. But they do, or rather we do, because I'm one of them, have some buildings, community centers, exhibits, and so forth, which challenge the hegemonic narrative about Great Britain 
and the British Empire. In the top left is the Kuwumba Imani Millennium Center in Liverpool. To the right is the Bernie Grant's Art Center in London. Bernie Grant was one of the first uh, four or five black members of parliament ever elected in Britain in the 1980s. The statue to the left is of Mary Sue Cole, Mary C. Cole, uh, a Jamaican born uh, black woman who worked uh, at the same time as Florence Nightingale in the Crimean War. And to the right is an organization called Serendipity, which is in Leicester uh, and is a black arts uh, organization uh, to celebrate black creativity and ingenuity. Okay. Black people's monuments also can be found in writing, in music and film. Here's a series of books that came out from the 1980s through to the present time. Uh, some of you may have seen the five part series, Small Acts by award winner, Sir Steve McQueen, which documents black life in London. Diane Abbott is member of parliament in London. She's the longest standing black member of parliament or nationally elected black politician in the whole of Europe, in the whole of Europe. She was elected in 1987. White Man Country is the name of a, a song produced by Muta Baruka, a reggae artist, which as you can see here is being juxtaposed with uh, an image, a drawing of George Floyd. Uh, Muta Baruka's record, by the way, is from the 1980s, not from the present time. Babylon is the film that was produced, one of the first black British films produced about life for young black men and to some extent black women, but mainly black men. And then Making History is a series of documents by Linton Kwesi Johnson, one of the foremost uh, analysts of uh, the black presence in Britain and the Caribbean. Okay. Now people will say to me, why are you so critical of British education? Why do you talk about the colonization of black people's minds in England after everything that British education has done for you. And my response is, I succeeded in spite of British education, not because of British education. At every turn I encountered, there were racist stereotypes, there was hostility, there was violence. And in all the books I read at school, up towards my, my bachelor's degree, which I did in the 1970s, I don't remember seeing anything positive in books about black people. All of the Africans were savage, barbarian, and women typically naked. All of the white British people were dressed, civil, civilized, and there to save black people. So this was my experience, and from the research that I read recently, it hasn't changed in any dramatic way, even though it's true that there are significant publications since then. Okay. A second issue, I recently did an interview in England about some of these issues about five months ago. And the person interviewing me said, you know, when you were growing up, when you were a teenager in the 1970s, were you worried about these statues and these houses? And I said, worried about it? I didn't, have, I didn't know about them. I didn't care about them. I was just trying to stay alive in the face of white violence, white masculine violence, verbal abuse, soccer violence, and skinheads. So this is part of the, the, the variety of issues that um, reflect what I would call the legacy of slavery and colonialism, okay. And this is not just in England. Increasingly black people and non-black allies around Europe are challenging the dominant explanations by government, by universities, by politicians, by the mainstream media about the role of France, of the Netherlands, of Portugal, of Spain, of Germany, and others in slavery and imperialism, questioning the assumptions, challenging the evidence, highlighting the silences and the omissions. And I just give you some examples there. Okay. I'm coming to a close. The United States has its analogues and counterparts of British stately homes. Although given the reluctance in this country to make class a concept that's relevant to the discussion of the endemic and entrenched inequality, these are not called houses of the nobility or the aristocracy. 
This to the left is a book I co-wrote with my colleague, Jennifer Eichstadt. It was published in 2002. And it's based on visits to 120 plantation heritage sites, including several of these in Virginia and Louisiana. We also went to Georgia. And it documents the ways in which class is indispensable in the celebration of these big houses alongside race and racism. That was in 2002. And since then, I've been to at least, well, for that book, we looked at 120 museums in these three states. I've been to a lot more since then. Okay. In my forthcoming book, which uh, Tom kindly mentioned, which is called Inside the Shadows of the Big House, I expect that to be published in 2022. Uh, I focus on 15 so-called slave cabins in three plantations in Northern Louisiana, in a town which I'm about to pronounce terribly, Natchitoches. Okay. And these plantations uh, house 15 cabins. And the book asks, what, do, what does public heritage and the heritage of Southern history look like if you begin with the so-called cabins and the majority population on the plantation? rather than with the so-called big houses uh, and the minority on the plantation. Okay. So in conclusion, slavery, imperialism, and their legacies, stately homes bring us beyond the usual suspects, beyond the usual suspects of so-called slave traders, of slave merchants, of so-called slave catchers, and the owners of plantations. They recognize and reveal that the impact, the, the political impact, the economic impact, the beneficiaries and the economic activities went far beyond the usual suspects, went far beyond the usual cities of London, Bristol, and Liverpool, went far beyond the typical men that owned these plantations. And Draper and Catherine Hall and colleagues document many of the women who directed, uh, who benefited directly from uh, the profits of slavery and from inheritances. So a focus on stately homes is an end in itself to provide more details about the who, what, when, where, and why of these homes. And it's also a means to an end to provide a broader, more accurate, more comprehensive a more inclusive knowledge of the public history of British slavery, British imperialism, and its legacies. The men and women who are targeting the statues and memorials across Britain today, these statues and memorials, and indeed museums, are the physical embodiment of partiality and bias. They constitute an infrastructure dedicated to creating a distorted, problematic, and even mythological memory of British slavery and imperialism. It's an infrastructure of stately homes and other buildings that privileges the experiences and memories of elite white men and occasionally women, and an infrastructure that constantly avoids, sidelines, silences, or annihilates mention of slavery and colonialism. In other words, it avoids mention of the land and labor that provided the economic and political power, the social and cultural prestige that enabled these memorials to be built, remembered, documented in the first place. It's understandable that statues and stately homes are being targeted given their cathartic effects. And yet on their own, we know that these actions actions against stately homes and statues. We know that these actions will not remove the underlying obstacles to knowledge creation, education, that attacking statues, renaming statues, or country houses will not lead to healing or complete healing and empowerment, though clearly it will have and does have cathartic effects. So what I'm suggesting is that beyond the stately houses, Beyond the statues, we must recognize too that there are sustained efforts 
being directed towards curricula, towards expanding and diversifying staff in schools, universities, and museums, and to increasing access to resources. At the present time, it seems like there's an opening. There have been initiatives in England that I believe are unprecedented, uh, things that provide opportunities directly and exclusively for people of color. Uh, not a lot of them, but certainly several that seem to be unprecedented. And it seems that there are a series of openings in Britain, in England, that can be uh, receptive and uh, conducive to change. If the momentum can be maintained, if the momentum rather can be maintained, there could be significant improvements. However, as I've mentioned, the government and several people in power are not taking this hands down. And there has been a significant uh, resistance and what I would also call uh, a backlash. People ask me if I'm optimistic. The best I can say is that I'm cautiously optimistic and I'm not holding my breath for the moment. Many of the people involved are engaged in public relations exercise, in tokenistic gestures, and I'm waiting to see over the coming years and decades whether there'll be a more sustained and fundamental uh, transformation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen. Um, uh, that was a very informative and inspiring talk. And yes, uh, it is. Uh, it is, um, there's ground for cautious optimism may, maybe, but <laughs> um, for, from our own situation here in the United States, we can see how difficult it is to, to make real progress with so many sure. things re resisting it. Um, I, I will now- Thank uh, you, Donald. I will now look into the chat and see what kind of questions have come in. And I invite people to continue asking uh, questions through the chat. Um, so let's see what we have here. <clears throat> All right, here's one from uh, Gloria uh, Bradles, Bradley Sapp. Uh, I believe there's a history of slavery museum in Liverpool. Um, do you have a, an assessment of this museum and its place in educating the public about the slave trade and British involvement? Thank you very much. That's an easy one. Um, that International Slavery Museum in Liverpool began in 2007, but it began actually with something called the Atlantic Slave Trade Gallery which opened in 1994. And in that Atlantic Slave Trade Gallery, I was a guest curator, a member of the Board of Advisors, and a member of a number of community groups. And I was central to the uh, development of the gallery. Um, I haven't been central to the development of the International Slavery Museum, but I do go there every year or two. I'm in direct contact with uh, Richard Benjamin, who's the director. The I think it's a fantastic development, but let me tell you briefly the story. Peter Moores was at that time a multimillionaire. I believe he's now deceased. and part of the Moores family in Liverpool. Uh, and he donated far, uh, half a million pounds to a gallery on the slave trade. And he made an announcement in 1992 about this gallery and there were maybe 80 or 90 people present. I was present, about, two, about one third was black. And a number of black people stridently opposed the gallery, said they want nothing to do with it. They don't believe the first gallery on black people should be about slavery. Uh, they don't believe that white people should be uh, at the forefront of any of this. Half of the black people were in favor of the gallery and I stuck with the gallery. And my argument was that the gallery was going to go ahead. It was going to be located in the Albert Dock, which is a very popular tourist attraction in the whole of the north of England. And that if black people are not involved, then it wouldn't you know, meet any of our needs. Okay. Following that, we, a number of guest curators and a number of black community organizations, were able to persuade Peter Moores to expand the gallery from the slave trade to several other areas a focus on Africa before Europeans, a focus on the so-called Middle Passage, a focus on slavery, and also a number of black people in Liverpool said, why are we focusing on slavery in the past when we are still living in slavery today? Okay, given, and that was in 1992, given the extensive inequality in Liverpool. So that's the background. And what I argue is that that museum is necessary 
and useful and beneficial. I have some family members and friends who say, I want nothing to do with the museum. And I say, you're not required to go to the museum. There are a lot of people who want not. I say, that's fine. However, given the misinformation, the disinformation, the distortion about slavery that was prevalent at that time and remains largely prevalent, it's necessary that there should be a museum that addresses these issues for people that go, okay? Uh, let me finish by saying this. I gave a talk at the International Slave M Museum in August last year, and in conversation with Richard Benjamin, the director, he said, if people in the city, especially black people, do not criticize the museum, then we know we're not doing a good job. It's not gonna be perfect, but we, uh, we engage with the criticism uh, to make it better. So I hope that answers part of your question. Oh, I can also say that uh, museums around Europe, uh, many people visit Liverpool. The people who organized the Liverpool Gallery and then the museum visited the United States, visited the Smithsonian, okay? As Tom pointed out at the start, I was resident director of education abroad in Bordeaux for two years in 2002 to four. There was almost nothing public in museums on slavery, maybe a portrait of a black person, okay? Since then, after making a number of visits and largely because of black and multiracial protest in France, Bordeaux Museum, the main museum, I think it's Musée d'Aquitaine, has a small exhibit on slavery. Let me finish there. Thank you. Uh, Mary Kay Duggan asks, are there any extant housing quarters for slaves in England? Would such slaves have fit, lived in the mansions themselves? Housing quarters for slaves? You know, it's a good question. In a recent article that uh, Jessica Moody and I published, Jessica, who has more knowledge of this, says there are few or none uh, uh, housing quarters that are similar to slave cabins because in large part, there were so few people, black people enslaved. And the reason there were so few black people enslaved is not because of British uh, benevolence, but because the British put Irish and English working class men and women to do the kind of jobs uh, that were done uh, to some extent, not identical to some extent, okay? So uh, it's a question I'm gonna look into, uh, but I think there are very few, okay? However, there are certainly spaces in these stately houses where enslaved people live, okay? Uh, sorry, where enslaved people lived, so-called servants, okay? Uh, so we do know, and we do have records, quite extensive records actually, of uh, numbers of black people, uh, many of whom were enslaved, but also a tiny but significant minority who were not enslaved, who were used, if I could call it this way, as guinea pigs for education, who were taught to read and write, to play music. And there are several books on that. I think the best person, not well, the best person to begin with is James Walvin. He was one of the first people to publish a book on the history of black people in Britain. And then there's another person called Folar and Shylon. Should I put that in the chat? What should I do? Yes, it's that's, that's, that would be good. That would be excellent. Okay. So James Walvin, and there's a woman called Gazima. I forget her first name. Uh, several books. So I hope that answers your question. Right, thank you. Oh, um, let me say one other thing, if you don't mind. You know, there's a myth. Do I want to call it? No, let's not call it a myth. There's a story in Liverpool that enslaved people were kept in some dungeons in the docks at the, the pier. And people who are not black become very excited and, and anxious and tense in denying that there were ever enslaved people in Liverpool, okay? It's clear that there were enslaved people in, in Liverpool. It's very clear, it's documented in newspapers and press and so on. Whether they were kept in a dungeon or not is another matter. But I think the problem is that people who are not black in Liverpool want to fight over the literalness or the literality, if that's a word, of whether we're enslaved or not. Whereas black people want to communicate that, look, slavery happened in England, in Liverpool, on our doorstep, not just in the colonies, and that these issues need to be addressed. Okay, thank you. Um, what was Gladstone's position in Parliament and as PM towards slavery, asked Diana Bolt. Okay. So uh, the father, Gladstone, John Gladstone, uh, 
was the recipient of the largest amount uh, of money compensation for the ownership of enslaved people. Uh, the numbers slip me right now, but the father uh, owned, you know, hundreds, maybe more of enslaved people and got more money than anyone else in the entire UK when those enslaved people were legally freed. He was stridently against abolition and his son initially was against abolition too, okay? But the son became far more politically famous and powerful than the father. William Newark Gladstone uh, became prime minister on four occasions and is what's called a so-called liberal imperialist. Now, forgive me, but I regard liberal imperialist in ac academic jargon as an oxymoron and in colloquial jargon as complete nonsense. A liberal imperialist is a concept that was invented by British, mainly white scholars, to describe a so-called kind of uh, civilizing process. And what we find is that during the imperial period, British imperial period, let's say from the 1870s forward, we now have evidence, and we've had it for a long time, of black men and women, African-American, African-Caribbean, who challenge and dispute every argument that Britain made about its so-called benevolent, benevolent imperialism. Okay, so the father benefited directly financially. He used that money to send his sons and a couple of daughters, I think one of them died, to Eton private schools and to become rich and powerful in Britain. I think that's the answer. Thank you. Uh, Simon Gorin asks, to what extent did the royal family benefit from slavery? And I, I will add to that, did they get compensation <laughs> when, when uh, abolition took place? I don't think I'm going to answer that because I don't know. Okay. Uh, I don't know. You know, I would be absolutely, I don't know. I don't have the evidence immediately at hand. Let, but let me say this. I would be astounded if members of the royal family didn't benefit directly and indirectly. They must have benefited. They did benefit by being in charge of a nation that became the largest slaving nation on the planet. Okay. So, uh, so that's my response. It, has it been documented? You know, increasingly it has. I think that, you know, the people, well, you know what? It's very simple. You just go to, if you want an answer to that question, you just go to the University College London Legacies of British Slave Ownership website. So it's best I don't say any more, but, you know, I, you know, my position these days, you know, let's call it, I've been trained, so I know how to frame these things. Let's call this a heuristic tool. Britain has always argued that the nation was not racist, but there are a few bad apples. My position these days is that the evidence reveals every class sector of Britain was always racist, but there were a few, let's call them good apples. And then we get into an argument over who's racist and who's not. And we're not talking about Ku Klux Klan racism. We're talking about the widespread acceptance, articulation, insistence by elite men and women and by poor men and women that Africans are inferior, that Africans have produced no culture, that Africans should not be allowed into Britain, so on and so forth. So, uh, so that would be my position right now. And you know, at the risk of offending the royal family, I mean, there's a couple of royal family members living here who are currently being offended, I'll leave that to other people. Um, I'd, I'd say, you know, it merits further investigation, but I would be stunned to use a British phrase, phrase, you could knock me over with a feather if it turns out they were not involved. Um, Rebecca Tracy asks, what are the links to slavery for Harewood House? For who? Harewood House. The one, the, uh, one the, of the ones I showed, well, look, it, 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 that was, it was built during the period of slavery. Uh, I don't have the details. I didn't pr prepare the details, but James Wolven has done several detailed reports. So I suggest you look at, at James Wolven, Wolven's reports and the National Trust reports on, I think, 90 properties. Well, so I, I don't know in detail. I haven't visited Harewood House. Well, it's always presented as one of the foremost houses 
that got money directly from slavery, whose owners lived or were absentee slave owners, so-called, um, and, and that goes back to at least the 1700s. So, you know, I assume this, well, I assume the PowerPoint will be available. I'm more than ha happy to make the PowerPoints available. Shall okay. I do that? No, the, the LAR site will do that. That's why yeah, we Yeah, the site will do that. Okay. So then you can follow up. Okay. Okay. Um, going back to the, um, uh, the fact, fact that the slaves may have worked in the big, in the great houses, um, uh, uh, African slaves, um, mm -hmm. uh, do we have any evidence about how, um, whether there was a hierarchy with the other in, people in so-called in service? Um, the Irish the and, the, the, and the working class people who were in service in the house who also lived in the house probably. Okay. Do we have any evidence about, Yeah. You know, are, are you talking about the US? No, no, I'm talking about- uh, In England. In, in England. You know, I have, you know, I haven't looked at it. I haven't looked at that for, for a little while. Okay, well, again, you know, Every society is stratified. Every community is stratified uh, with material, uh, mental, emotional, and, and spiritual benefits and disadvantages. So I, be, I would be shocked. You know, uh, all of these houses in Britain had a ranking order, what the Brits call upstairs and downstairs. And upstairs had the ranking order, as did downstairs. The main issue I'd like to bring to your attention is that the ranking order that was imposed on black people by the elite whites was not the same as the ranking order of estimation held by black men and women. The people that the whites held in most esteem or let's call it trust, were not the people that black people held in most esteem. It depended for black people enslaved or legally free on issues to do with, you know, issues around commitment, around identity and so on and so forth. Um, has anyone written on these issues? Well, you know, again, well, James Woven, but he's old. Let me think, who's the more recent? Um, I can't think of, you know, there's a, there's a lot more books on these dynamics in, in, in recent times. Um, Ray Costello has written a lot on Liverpool. Oh, I know. No, wait a minute, Madge Dresser. Stephen, if you're writing things in the chat, make sure you press enter so that they go, so everyone can see them. Well, I'm pressing return and then they appear. Does that look like it's working? Uh, is it addressed to everybody? Yeah. Oh no, I'm oh. sending it all to Tom. I beg your pardon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, let's see. I wonder, Tom, could I beg you, Tom, to forward it to everybody? Oh, let's see. So Madge, that's it. Or is there, I'm not sure if there's a, I don't know, I'm not familiar with whether you can forward it after you've sent it. Uh, maybe you could probably copy Tom, it. Tom could copy and paste it. Yeah, and you, could, you could copy and paste too from. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Um, right. Madge Dresser is, is, has got uh, several books, at least two major books on the history of country houses. Uh, who is the other person? Jessica Moody, as I said, has written. And there's one other person who's written on the Tudors. Oh, good gosh, who is that? I can't remember. But you know, the, these books will give you some, and then the National Trust, of course, has several, uh, a couple of reports. Okay. And uh, so they're quite prominent. So, you know, it, it, this raises the issue, you know, at present, I don't think we have a lot of information about the lives of black people in these mansions. We certainly have information about the elite ones. You know, there were uh, black people in the so-called courts of the aristocracy individuals and some of them are documented yeah so let me let me finish with that okay interesting question all right so i think um the questions in the chat have more or less uh petered out um but i'm we can now open it up for anybody who didn't uh, has wants to ask a question orally um uh, so if camille will make it possible for you to uh, unmute yourself so um i guess if you just want to pipe up that's probably the best best way to uh Make a question. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Hello, uh, this is Nelson Graben in anthropology at UC Berkeley. I came from England, but I've been here a little bit longer. Good Stephen. to hear from you, Nelson. Thank you. Uh, I ran into the kind of thing you're talking about, only not necessarily with African Blacks, but foreign forms of darkness in that my uh, aunt, 
1894 married a man from Ceylon who'd come to the Inns of Court to learn British law and go out and rule the empire like Gandhi did. And he was sent to South Africa. My uncle was sent to uh, Shaman, which is then called Amoy, uh, became a lawyer and so on. And so the, the discussion of, of peoples was something that was very common in my family. And even though all of my uncles and aunts except one and all my, my parents spent nearly all their working lives uh, in the tropics, in colonized countries, etc., there was a lot of discussion, some of it open, some of it behind people's backs. But one general thing that, that isn't necessarily part of your talk, but that came out was, the people who had lived in the colonies where they were in the minority and they worked with people were much, much less racist than English people. I remember, for instance, a man, upper class, large scale farm owner, not quite stately house, asking my father, well, tell me, Henry, you know, are the Chinese really human? My father said, well, yes, if you have to work with them, he said, if you treat them like gentlemen, they're gentlemen. And my father, I wasn't say was liberal at all, but this is a kind of argument he had to make. He would ask my mother things like, oh, you, met, you let those dark people into the kitchen? You, you let them touch your dishes? My mother would say, yes, and sometimes they're very good cooks if you train them. So I think there's a kind of fantasy relationship with, uh, with colored people in England for people who've never really met colored people. And then there's another kind of relationship, which is maybe a different call of sort of racism with those who did, whether it was oppressive or exploitative or not. And not all the empire was completely ranked hierarchically by color. But what do you think of the idea of that there was a different kind of attitude of racism, very much all inside my family? <laughs> uh, well, Nelson, you know, I don't want to comment on your family or say anything offensive about your family. But the issue for they me- They did about themselves. <laughs> yeah, that, what they're, more, you know, they're more than welcome to do that. But that's not my position. You know. What I say is I'm far less interested in the personal attitudes and personal behavior of individuals in their interactions with people of color. And I'm far more interested in state procedures, government laws, material practices, political power, largely masculine in shaping or constraining how people can interact. I do believe that there are some people who are more racist than others and some who are less racist. But I've told you my position that on the basis of the evidence and my definition of racism, they were all racist to different degrees. And I think it's very difficult to come to the conclusion that anyone in England was not racist, given the kinds of literature, the kinds of information, the kinds of religious dictates that were being portrayed uh, by the British Empire in high circles and in low circles. Um, so I find that difficult to believe. The final thing I would say is your, your comment suggests that personal experience could reduce racism. I think all the evidence in Liverpool demonstrates entirely the opposite. Every city I go to in England, black people tell me nowhere is worse for black people than this city. And I'm convinced Liverpool is the worst. Given that black people in Liverpool can trace their origins at least to the early 1700s. Right now, there is no black middle class. Black people remain overwhelmingly concentrated, segregated into one neighborhood, Liverpool 8. It's very difficult to find a black person in the city center. And yet the city elders, politicians, uh, business leaders, proclaim racial harmony forever in Liverpool. Every single person who proclaims racial harmony, I believe has no evidence besides personal anecdotes. Whereas every study demonstrates the opposite. So, you know, I'm glad there were some cordial relations yeah, uh, but it's 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 not my primary concern. Steve, I have a quick question for you. Yeah. Stephen, yeah. um, you may know that in the last month there's been a real public reaction in France against critical race theory. And I noticed on, on one of your first slides, uh, as a member of the parliament, I believe, who also attacked critical race theory. Yeah. 
Do you have a sense of what's going on with that in England now? Um, yeah. Is that you, Troy? Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. Troy, Troy's my mentor, close friend, was my professor, and still talks to me. <laughs> Funnily, okay. Um, yeah, I do. Here's what's going on. Let me think about it. You know, it, it's very similar. You know, look, the US and the nations in Europe have fundamental differences, but there are also similarities and they exist alongside one another. And what's going on in France is similar to what's going on in England. After having a hegemonic and dominating articulation by the state, by politicians, by media, by scholars of the role of each nation in Europe, it, in slavery and colonialism. It's now being challenged and there's a, an overwhelming backlash. They want, pardon? I can't. And they won't, they won't um, allow or entertain any criticism whatsoever. Okay. So the specifics in France are different from the specifics in England, but the process is similar. It's dominated by an idea that there is no racism in Europe. Racism is in the USA. Ask anybody in Europe today. It existed before you know who, your previous president. It's always been there. And Britain, France, Netherlands, Spain, they are absolutely not racist, okay? And for people to say they are racist is an indignant accusation and is basically borrowing from the US, okay? So, so that's what's going on in France. The particular thing in France is that there's a national, I call it an inflection. Let me give you an idea. So in Britain, if you say to the British, you're racist, they'll say, but we're not racist. We abolish slavery. It's the Americans, they're the racist. If you go to France and say, you people are racist, they'll say, oh, it's racist. Liberté, égalité, fraternité. We've never been racist. <laughs> it's the Americans and the British. And then you go to Portugal and you say, you people are racist. They say, but we're not racist. We civilized the savages. We gave them Catholicism. We gave them culture. We discovered their countries. It's not us. It's the British. It's the Anglos. It's the same in Italy. It's the same. And you go to Scandinavian countries, and I'm talking about state actors, politicians, scholars, okay? When you go to Norway and Sweden, you know what they say? We were not involved in colonialism. It wasn't us. It's entirely untrue. Norway, Sweden, and Denmark all established companies to create colonies in Africa. They established actions and activities to create enslaved colonies in what became the Americas. And it was almost part of your CV. If you were a ruler of these nations, royal or, or state, it was almost part of your CV to have a colony of enslaved black people. That's why they created the Berlin Conference. So there are these variations. And what's going on in France is, is, is particularly difficult, okay? But France has far more in common with the rest of Europe. Let me say one thing, one final thing on this issue for Troy. In my book, Black Europe, 20 Questions and Answers on Black Europe, I argue, I estimate rather, that there are 7 million black people, 7 million black people in the, the whole of Europe. That's 46 or more countries. And of those 7 million, over 90% are in 12 countries, all the obvious countries. Over 90% are in 12 countries, okay. And if you look at those 12 countries, there are around 4,000 nationally elected politicians in those 12 countries. And of those 4,000, there are around 23 or 24, maybe 25 black politicians of African or Caribbean origin. 23 or 24, it varies, out of 4,000, okay? And so people ask, the obvious question is why? And what I argue is that in England, black people have been there longer, arrived as citizens, arrived as, as, as Christians, and had a longer tradition for more years of political activism inside England and in the Caribbean. And what's going on in France is they don't have that same tradition to the same extent. Yeah. There's always black people fighting in all these countries with white allies, okay? So in brief, uh, the specifics of France uh, are important, but it's part of a general European trend that we are not racist, we are colorblind, and happiness will be achieved by not following the Americans who are the real racists.
Thank you. I love you. I've got rid of the Zoom, but that doesn't matter. Right? Okay. Uh, any other? We have any other questions uh, to be made? Anyone else want to speak up? I want to say something about imperialism, but I can wait. No, uh, go ahead. Okay. Well, again, you know, one of the things I'm particularly interested in is British imperialism. And I've come to this in the last few years. And it was sparked off by a number of things by reading what I call Black Voices of Anti-Imperialism at the Pan-African Congress a conference in London in 1900, which was attended by a number of Afro-Americans, African-Americans like Anna Julia Cooper and, and Du Bois and so on. Okay. And I've become more interested since all the public discussion is on legacies of slavery. And I started to think about, well, what is a direct legacy of slavery? What's a direct legacy of imperialism? Does it matter? Okay. And what I'm doing now is, is, is research into these issues. And my point of departure is this, that imperialism is a direct legacy of slavery. But imperialism also created its own legacies and that these legacies have different dynamics, all racialized, all gendered, but they have different dynamics that can't be explained or understood based on slavery alone. So for example, British slavery primarily organized itself to take Africans forcibly to the Americas. But under British imperialism, several hundred thousand West Indians were brought to Britain. And we can't understand why there are so many West Indians. Most of them are now British born like myself. My dad's from Jamaica without looking at imperialism. Okay. In addition, I look at the city of Liverpool and what we know is that British slavery turned Liverpool from a village into a town. But British imperialism turned the town into a city. And what you'll see when you look at the main buildings, the statues, the street names, Many of them are named after, after imperialists rather than after enslavers. And many of the statues and buildings named after enslavers were created in the imperial period rather than the period of slavery. So right now, for example, I'm an external member of a committee at the University of Liverpool. This is a committee which is operating under Dean Dinah Birch, and it's looking at the issue of renaming buildings at Liverpool University campus and, and student accommodations. And the primary focus, I've been on that committee for eight months as we discuss the principles for renaming, who should get to rename and so on. And the primary focus is on William Ewart Gladstone of whom one of the student accommodations is named after, okay? And also at buildings associated with Tate and with Leverhulme, okay? Let me finish by saying this, okay? The benefits of looking at imperialism are that they extend our understanding of the dynamics of these legacies. Okay. They remind us that British abolition absolutely did not free black people. Political domination, economic exploitation absolutely continued after abolition. They also remind us that variations of racism were developed and elaborated from biological racism into social Darwinism, into eugenics, into other kinds of cultural racism that emerge from the changing scientific knowledge, political knowledge, state competition of the period. And finally, before I finish, and most importantly for me, during slavery, black people were extensively prevented from rec uh, registering our voices, our analyses, our hopes and dreams. And during imperialism, we find far more black women and men who have bequeathed to us thousands of documents by African-Americans, by Africans, by West Indians that offer a far more accurate, a far more comprehensive and a far more inclusive uh, understanding and evidence uh, than we get from, uh, from scholars that, that dominate in these nations. And uh, I recently asked a friend of mine, black woman in London, I said, is it still true that when black people look at black people outside of England, they spend 90% of their time looking at African-Americans because African-Americans have been so inspirational to us. Is it still true 90% of the time? She said, no, 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 that's not true. It's 99%. When black people in England look at the US, like non-black people, it's all the US. 
And what I argue is the U.S. experience has been indispensable for me, personally, professionally. Okay. But the U.S. black experience can't explain imperialism in Europe because the dynamic, the U.S. is certainly an imperial nation, but the dynamics of European imperialism after the legal abolition of slavery it provide a far better explanation of why there are so few black people in Europe, why there is such a belief in, in racelessness and, and, and a number of other issues. And Tom is my uh, interlocutor for British imperialism. We're having some nice, healthy discussions uh, uh, about these issues. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Stephen. Um, and thanks to the audience for uh, good questions and discussion and for your interest. Uh, and uh, as usual, uh, in a few days, the uh, recording of this lecture will be available at the LIR website. Uh, so uh, remember, our next one is on Monday next week, uh, the second in this series. Okay. So, Donald, then... can I just give a final statement, if you don't mind? Sure, yes. I'll make it very quick. Um, I have focused on slavery for many decades, but I also want to make it clear that I do extensive work on contemporary issues to do with people of color. And I've done that and taught a course comparing different groups within the U.S., and in terms of international migration for more than 20 years. And recently I became director of the Institute for the Study of Societal Issues on campus, an organized research institute, which is very actively engaged in contemporary research, in contemporary inequality, in contemporary social change, and in training mainly but not exclusively graduate students of color who are researching these issues. So I don't want you to get the idea that this is my only or primary uh, focus, it is not. My main focus as a professor on campus right now and as director of the Institute is to ensure that we continue to produce uh, graduates of color and graduates who are not people of color, uh, who are involved in social change around contemporary issues within the nation and internationally. Thank you very much for allowing me to say that, Donald. Thank you for your talk. All right, um, thank you everybody. And bye-bye.